A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the descendants of my people shall be renowned among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who sue them shall acknowledge them as a race the Lord has blessed. I rejoice heartily in the Lord, and my God is the joy of my soul, for he has clothed me with the robe of salvation and wrapped me in a mantle of justice, like a bridegroom adorned with a diadem, like a bride bedecked with her jewels. As the earth brings forth its plants, and a garden makes its growth spring up, so will the Lord God make justice and praise spring up before all the nations. them he 
Blessed is the Virgin Mary, who kept the word of God and pondered it in her heart. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Dominus Fabisco. Sio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Luca. Each year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up according to festival custom. After they had completed its days as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. <laughs> Today, Holy Mother Church celebrates the beautiful memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and how fitting it is that the memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the solemnity of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus every year follow in close proximity one feast to the other. After all, it was within the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary that the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus was carried, literally. God became man. Our God, who while retaining his divine personage, the second person of the most holy, blessed, and all-adored Trinity, assumed our human nature in every way but sin. He took on human beingship while remaining a divine person. He had a beating, viable, pumping, bloody heart. This is a revealed God. This is a God who has manifested himself. And our Blessed Mother carried him in her womb. And we know that she pondered the mysteries of his life in her heart, one example of which is in today's Gospel, upon the finding of the boy Jesus in the temple. Now, poetically speaking, my friends, the human heart in large regard, even across cultures, has always seen, has always been seen, poetically speaking, as a profound symbol of the following. Love, faithfulness, steadfastness, commitment, passion, that is, a love that is willing to suffer for the other, being other-centered as opposed to self-centered. Passio, huh? Loyalty. Diligence. And the human heart is also often seen, again, poetically speaking, as the very anchor, that is, the very foundation of a balanced emotional life 
involving the feelings, the passions, and the emotions. Those three words are used interchangeably in the moral section in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The feelings, the emotions, the passions, a balanced emotional life. So again, poetically speaking, even seemingly across cultures, the human heart has often been viewed as a profound symbol of love, faithfulness, steadfastness, commitment, passion, loyalty, diligence, and the anchor or the very foundation of a balanced emotional life involving, of course, the feelings, the passions, and the emotions. Now, we know that when Mary was a teenager, she said to her Lord and God through the archangel Gabriel, let it be done unto me according to your word. Let it be done unto me according to your word. Now, I want you to hang on to that word, it, quote, unquote. Let it, Gabriel, everything you've just revealed to me, Archangel Gabriel, let it be done unto me according to your word, for I am the handmaiden of the Lord. At this, she became the mother of God, and seemingly, at the same time, an unmarried, pregnant woman who could expect execution in first century Palestine. Her it to Gabriel meant that. Pretty profound. And yet she was willing to take it on because of her love, because of her faithfulness, because of her steadfastness, because of her commitment, because of her passion, because of her loyalty, because of her diligence, and because of her anchor, her foundation in the life of the feelings, the emotions, and the passions. What an example our Blessed Mother is for us when her it to Gabriel meant that she was putting her life at risk according to current Jewish law for first century Palestine at that time. Next, her it meant having her baby in a stable. Soon, her it to Gabriel meant traveling with Joseph and the baby Jesus in the middle of the night to Egypt. Her it meant that. Twelve years later, Mary's it to Gabriel, let it be done unto me as you have said, her it meant losing Jesus at the Passover in Jerusalem. This prefigured a Passover about 20 years later when Jesus would become the slain Passover lamb himself. And at the foot of the cross, Mary's it would witness his being slain. Mary's it to Gabriel also meant the first Christian Pentecost. It also meant her assumption into heaven. And it also meant her crowning as the queen of heaven and earth as the mother of God. Indeed, the Blessed Virgin Mary to her Lord through the Archangel Gabriel said, let it be done unto me according to your word. Even though her it to Gabriel meant all these seemingly negative things until the end of her life, being present at Pentecost, her assumption into heaven, her crowning as the mother of God, queen of heaven and earth, which are more positive realities <laughs> to Mary's it. But how did she endure the majority of her life these elements of sorrow that involve the very life of her son? Because of her immaculate heart. That's why. That's why and that's how she was able to sustain the great example that she is as the perfect Christian disciple in faith and discipleship itself, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The perfect Christian example is Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, precisely because of her immaculate heart 
which is a model for our own hearts, because throughout her entire life, believing in the words of the Archangel Gabriel, Mary maintained or retained in her Immaculate Heart all those things that, poetically speaking, the human heart symbolizes or is a profound symbol of or speaks of. Again, love, faithfulness, steadfastness, commitment, passion, that is, passio, the love that is willing to suffer for the other. Think of the pieta, Christ just having been taken down from the cross. And our blessed mother, steadfast at the foot of the cross. It's interesting that the ancient hymn is called Stabat Mother, Standing Mother. We have no reason to believe, traditionally speaking, that Mary ever fainted or even swooned near a faint at the foot of the cross. She remained that steadfast. In fact, there's a story, and I would have to research it to find or discover the particulars of it because I do not know the particulars of it. But in the 4th or 5th century, there was a very well-known theologian who wanted to present a feast day, and he did so to the Holy Father at the time, the current Pope at the time. He had a personal devotion, this theologian did, of Our Lady of the Swoon. Okay? In other words, Mary's sorrow at the foot of the cross. And he wanted to call it the Our Lady of the Swoon because he had a devotion to her in all that she might have experienced at the cross. And the Pope at the time, and again, I would have to research the particulars to discover who the Pope was, but the Pope at the time said no. Because the ancient hymn, Stabat Mater, tells us that she remains steadfast, sorrowful, yes, no doubt, but never swooned nor fainted. Do we have any reason to believe that she ever swooned or fainted? She was the standing mother at the foot of the cross. She was the stabat mater at the foot of the cross. Now that's an example to us in our own times of sorrow. What an example Mary is to us. And again, it's because her immaculate heart stood for everything that, poetically speaking, the human heart is a profound symbol for. Love faithfulness, steadfastness, commitment, passion, loyalty, diligence, and the anchor or the very foundation of a strong, balanced emotional life involving, in and of itself, the emotions, the feelings, or the passions. My friends, the purpose of each human being's life is to say with Mary, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to God's will. So that we can really live our it whenever our it might mean a that that is seemingly negative in our own individual lives, just like Mary endured all the negatives from the get-go from being put under threat of execution by stoning from the moment she gave her fiat to the Archangel Gabriel. All of us, modeled after Mary, should be able to say with Mary, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to God's word. Then, when we find out the details of this total commitment and what it truly means, we must accept God's grace to be like Mary and to be faithful to our unconditional commitment to the Lord God himself. Consecrate your life to the most sacred heart of Jesus. Consecrate your life to the immaculate heart of Mary. Then never, ever, ever turn back. Really give your life to the sacred heart of Jesus, the immaculate heart of Mary. I wish to close now with a beautiful quote from Pope Benedict XVI regarding proper and sincere devotion 
to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So this isn't necessarily in defense of the Immaculate Heart devotion per se, no. But he gives beautiful, wonderful insight why we need true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. For example, in the words of St. Louis Marie de Montfort, the great Marian theologian, true devotion, authentic devotion, sincere devotion to the Mother of God. Pope Benedict recently said this, Mary's womb was the space from which God was able to gain access into humanity. We celebrate our personal relationship with Mary because it has fostered so profoundly the ultimate personal relationship, our relationship with Christ. Because we have fallen in love with the bridegroom, Jesus, we appreciate and honor his mother Mary immensely. Indeed, Mary helps us to love Jesus, to yield to the Spirit, and to let it be done to us according to God's word. Mary tells us to do whatever Jesus tells us. Words from the wedding feast at Cana. Mary will never rest until we rest in her son. I love that line. Mary will never rest until she knows that we rest in her son. Our relationship with Mary focuses us on Jesus. And because of this, we value our relationship with her. Again, regarding our devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mary's womb was the space from which God was able to gain access into humanity. We celebrate our personal relationship with Mary because it has fostered so profoundly the ultimate personal relationship, our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we have fallen in love with the bridegroom, Jesus, we appreciate and honor his mother Mary immensely. Indeed, Mary helps us to love Jesus, to yield to the Spirit, and to let it be done to us according to God's word. Mary also tells us to do whatever Jesus tells us. Words from the wedding feast at Cana in John chapter 2. And Mary will never rest until we rest in her son. Our relationship with Mary focuses us on Jesus. And because of this, we value our relationship with her. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. God bless you.